Um, that's my passion as it stands now. Now, I may change my mind here in a few years, but as it stands now, my passion is the gospel. And the church conference is, a, is an opportunity for me to share with you guys um, my heart for this community and our role as a church in this community. Does that make sense? And so it takes about a couple hours. If you're new to this church, I believe that time is far more valuable than money. I'm going to say that one more time. I think the most valuable gift you can give is time. And, and, and I get in trouble with older people in our church because I don't just endorse anything without me checking it out first uh, because I don't want to waste anybody's time. So I am absolutely, positively, fully committed that the 11th commandment is thou shall not committee. So I would not call a meeting to waste your time. So if you're, I believe time is, I believe that's the best gift you can give is time. And so if you have not been to church conference before, um, that's kind of my pitch for that. It's just a chance for me and some of the pastors to share where we see God strategically placed in our church. Um, and it's probably, I only do about three or four formal things a year. <laughs> Everything else is... <laughs> Out of control. So, so if you're looking for something formal, then that's your chance. Um, if you were raised or grew up in the church, this may be something you might be more familiar with that, that I do um, that looks kind of churchy. That, so that's my sales pitch for church conference. And this year, we're going to be talking about a little bit of discipleship. And we're going to be kind of passing out some tools to help you make disciples and be discipled. Amen? Amen? All right. Let's get in this word and see what God's doing. Now, okay, so the enemy... Uh, already this morning has thrown everything at me but the kitchen sink. So the way that I fight back is I preach and spit. So y'all going to have to just sit through this one. Y'all got to just sit there and smile. I'm not mad at nobody. Look at your neighbor real quick and say, he's not mad at you. Tell him real quick. He's not mad at you. I ain't got time for that after church. Don't you come up to me tell me, are you mad at me? All right. Don't have me cussing in the Lord's house. All right. All right, let me cuss in the Lord's house. So we're going we're gonna to really dissect this thing down a little bit. Go to Philippians chapter 3 if you have your Bibles. Philippians chapter 3. Let's really get into this thing here. Let's get into this thing here. Philippians chapter 3. Let's get into this thing. And we're going to look at uh, 17. And, and I'm, I'm going to read it to you. If you don't have your Bible, you're going to have to just listen to me read. I didn't put it on the screen on purpose. I didn't put it on the screen on purpose. So you get to listen on purpose. Yeah, I'm being judgmental this morning. You should have brought your Bible with you. It is the church. Or your cell phone or your iPad. Oh, yeah, I'm not mad at nobody, though. I love all y'all. I love all y'all. Yeah, we're going to get in trouble this morning. We're going to get in trouble. Look at this. If you can read this, you know, when I was a kid, you'd go to church, and sometimes the preacher was preaching to sinners, and then sometimes he was preaching to the saints. Now you kind of preach a say in or message. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of a little bit of the same. Little bit of, this ain't one of them messages here. This is, this is Southern Baptist right here. So you got to put your seatbelt on right here. This is a holiness message right here. This is one of them holiness messages. So if you ain't living right, just say, you got me, pastor. You got me. That's a, hey, it's in the book. We're going straight down through it. So glory to God. I had to read it before you did. So it's all good. This is what he says. This is Paul talking. He said, <laughs> some of y'all visitors are like, what is about to happen? I'm about to breathe fire in a second. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> join in imitating me, brothers and sisters. Paul said, join with me. Get in on this. And pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. If you are a new Christian, there are some godly people sitting around you that scriptures ask you not to worship, not to put on a pedestal, but to pay attention to. Okay, God didn't intend for you to navigate the waters of the kingdom by yourself. Okay? All right. All right. Everybody stay because they got that. 18. All right. For I have often told you, and now say it again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Saved. Go to church. But their lifestyle it's as if they're an enemy of the cross. He's talking about your lifestyle. So you can, yeah, you go up three-fourths of Americans if you ask them. Yeah, you sleep through this sermon, you tired. Three-fourths of Americans if you ask them. If you ask them, are you Christian and do you believe in God? Three-fourths of them are going to say yes. But if you look at their lifestyle, the way that they live, they're actually enemies of the cross. Okay? 
You're actually, you're actually doing the exact opposite of what the kingdom says glorifies Jesus with your life. Come as you are, but don't let anything go. And don't stay as you are. All right. All right. I'm making sure y'all say this, brother. I preached it to myself first. So, all right. Look, look at 19. This is one of the scariest verses. He says, their end is destruction. Well, they came forward in a service and said, Jesus is Lord. And they wrote down in the back of their Bible, I gave my life to Jesus on January. Their end is destruction. Why? He gives us three things. One, their God is their stomach, not God. Their emotions, their own desires, their own will tell them what to do, not God. So right now, you, you, all you got to ask yourself is, how do I know I'm an enemy of the cross? My emotions rule the day. My emotions tell me how to live my life. My desires tell me. My, my flesh tells me what's right and what's wrong. My flesh does. That's one mark. Ooh, Jesus, help us, Lord. Their glory is in the shame. This is the one that convicted me the most. This is the number two mark. And I, I, I got this strike against me. This is the glory. They, they glory in things that we should go, mm-mm. They go, yeah. This is the danger of YouTube. You can dress up shame. You can put a nice beat to it, and you can put good-looking clothes on shame, and you will celebrate shameful acts. You hear me, church? Just track with me now, because we got we, this is Repentance Sunday. We get to repent this Sunday. We should get excited so we can take communion with a repentful heart. This is your chance to repent this Sunday. We glory in things that Jesus would go, that ain't funny to me. That ain't funny to me. I got convicted on that. This is YouTube. This is social media. All right, that's my example this morning. I got a few more later on in the sermon. I'm going to get to your kitchen at some point in time. All right, all right, very good. We're on the same page. All right, and the third thing is they are focused on earthly things. I will have any conversation you want to have about any issue on this planet as long as we have it with God in our hearts and God on our mind. I'm not going to talk about racism like God don't still exist. I'm not going to talk about poverty like God's laying on his throne. I'm not going to talk about any of the social justice issues like there is no God. So if you want to talk to me about it with God as your point of reference and some hope in the conversation, I'll have the conversation. But if you're going to act like God is not sovereign and not in control, I don't got time for it because there is a Lord and there's bigger things than America. There's bigger things in America. Glory to God. All right, so you glory, all your focus is, is everything on this planet. And your idea of a good day is your political party or your basketball team or whatever can happen on this planet went well, so today was a good day. But that ain't what we're supposed to be looking at as kingdom citizens. I read the end of the book. We won, so let it go. You don't have to get angry. Victory is yours. You can relax, boo-boo, relax. Now look what he says about kingdom citizens in the 20th verse. But our citizenship, that's where we get our word political. That Greek word is where we get the word politics. Our politics is where? In heaven. So whether you pro-Trump, anti-Trump, your politics are where? Let me hear you again. All right, I want to make sure you're rolling with the right pastor because you can go to any one of these churches you want to. I'm not doing it. God is bigger than any president that has ever lived. Isaiah said, as soon as they get into power, God breathes on them. They don't have power no more. So all the people that are mad at George Washington ain't around no more. If it wasn't for Jesus, we wouldn't even know who Pilate was, and he was the man. Pontius Pilate was the man, and if it wasn't for Jesus, y'all wouldn't even know to say amen about that thing I just said. One time I was outside the fire escape. I was working out. These kids were debating. And this dude went to KU, and he had a crowd, and he was teaching on history. <laughs> and history is, is two words, his story. It means whoever's talking is his story, okay? <laughs> whoever's talking is his story. Yeah, I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> Let me tell you my his story, all right? And this dude's talking. He's talking about how Jesus didn't exist. He was breaking it down. He was intelligent, and I'm trying to, I didn't have, I'm, I had just worked out. I was mad. I don't work out happy. I'm mad the whole time. <laughs> I can't wait till we get to heaven. We ain't got to do this no more. If I get to heaven, I got six pack abs. I'm good to go, Jesus. I'm good to go. It's going to be a miracle, y'all. It's going to be a miracle. So I, I got through working out. He said, come on. Yeah, ain't that right, Pastor Jesus? There ain't no real proof Jesus existed. Tell the truth now, Pastor. Tell the truth. I said, name the Caesar. 
who was alive when Jesus was allegedly alive. Name the Caesar for me. And he couldn't. So let me get this right. You've been down here for 45 minutes talking about somebody you don't believe exists, and you can't name anybody back then that existed. Y'all see how ridiculous that is? Because history is up to God, not you. God decides who's remembered and who's not remembered. So I'm not going to, your politics needs to be in heaven because he's the one who decides it. Am I making sense? He's the one who decides who will be remembered. You can walk around here and pick it and post and do all you want and walk in circles too. They, the Bible said there came a time where the Jews didn't even know who the kids didn't even know who Moses was. There came a time for the Jews and most of the kids like, we don't really know Moses. I can tell most black folk don't know who Dr. King is. But they had to sit down if they knew who he was. Because he's against half the things we see on TV. So the reality is, God is on the throne. And all these characters that are the leading characters today are going to be forgotten for the most part. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm just telling you the truth. That's real, that's, that's real comforting. One day, they ain't gonna, nobody's going to know who DJ Dangerfield was. It would be so discouraging if I was worrying about what it meant to be down here. I'm going to be in heaven. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing it will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. So our, our, our kingdom is in heaven. He said, we eagerly wait for a Savior. From there, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so glad I'm in Chanute and they can't, I can't go viral. <laughs> <Y'all> be, <laughs> he will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body. So if you're a kingdom citizen, transformation for your body is coming. Say amen. Aren't you glad about that? You're no longer just dragging your right leg. for no, You know you're limping, aren't you? Am I? Am I limping? I didn't know. You're no longer dragging body parts with you for no reason. No more pulled muscles. No more arthritis. No more migraine headaches. No more fibromyalgia. No more unexplainable things. No more cancer. New bodies that disease can't touch. Glorious body. He's saying if you're a kingdom citizen, you got something to hope for, y'all. It doesn't mean we don't do any earthly good. We still got earthly good to do down here. But our life is not rooted in seeing the things that we want to see down here. There's something greater than me. And I'm anticipating his return. And he's going to set it straight. You hear me? He's going to set the record straight. It's good news. He said, by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. We're talking about Jesus. All right. Let's pray. Let's pray real quick so I don't mess this up. Y'all got me fired up. I'm blaming on everybody else in here. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Help the speaker this morning. Speak only what you'd have him to speak. Take my flesh and hide it behind the cross. May you only be glorified in this place. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I I was talking, I don't know who I was talking to earlier this week, somebody in here. And I was saying, I I don't, have you ever got on your own last nerves? Am I the only one where you're like, I get on my own nerve. I know some of y'all are the president of your fan club. God bless you. (laughs) I know some of you are the president of your own fan club. But I just, I get on my own nerves sometimes. Because I know the word. Not only do I know the word, I've lived it in, 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 in tumultuous situations and got the victory right there, right in front of my face. And then three weeks later, I find myself overly discouraged about something that does not matter. Oh, I know I'm not. Come on now. Don't make me go across the street and preach to the Christian church now. Come on now. You know, it's like, how come I, I should get this? And the enemy loves to scheme and trick. This is what he does. And then he, he, he robs you. You start living. You start trying to gratify yourself, Right? So if you feel anxiety, your first inclination isn't, what does God want from me? Your first inclination is, how do I get rid of this anxiety? Am I talking? Come on, church. I got to talk to me this Sunday because I'll be up here preaching forever. How do I? I'm discouraged. And so my first inclination isn't ask the Lord, what does he have for me to do today? My first inclination is to go, how do I get rid of this discouraging feeling? Okay? And even kingdom citizens can find themselves behaving in silly ways because our feelings become our belly. So I'm not just talking to drug users. I'm not just talking to promiscuous people. I'm not just talking to people who drink and party. Those are great examples, but there's some underneath sins that you can come to church every single Sunday that never get mentioned, that never get mentioned. 
Because whenever somebody starts about advancing the church, you get anxiety because you didn't used to do it that way. So instead of holding on to God's unchanging hand and paying attention to the change that's coming to the church, you start fighting people on change because you're really trying to relieve yourself of the anxiety of a new thing happening that you don't have control over. Come on, my Anglo-Saxons. Y'all know about this now. Don't look at me like that. Y'all know about this. Y'all know about this. New things start happening. And it freaks you out. Yeah, there's going to be three rows gone next week. Because <laughs> you just don't want it. I don't understand it. And so instead of seeking God's face and getting on your knees and bringing it to the Lord in prayer, you start trying to control everything. I'm going to get on the phone. Listen, girl, Angie, you ain't going to believe this. I heard... You better stand with me on this one. You know if they get away with this, they just, the church, this church has been here for a hundred and something many years. It's going to be here hundred and something many years, y'all. These churches don't need y'all. <laughs> it's evident. Some of these churches got nine people in them. They still in there. Nine people still meeting in a circle. Well, woke up this morning with my mind. <laughs> and they singing and they doing their four songs. Somebody shares, they go, nine people. This church is still going to be here. So when I talk about, I'm going to get into this text. I don't want you going, woo, I wish Uncle Fred was here. Man, Uncle Fred need to hear this living by your own belly. It is so subtle. The deeper you get into Christ, the more mature you become, the more subtle the enemy has to become to trick you. Now, so some of y'all, all he got to do is have somebody call you. You want to go drink? And you gone. Yeah! And that ain't very subtle. That's pretty easy for some of us. Some of us, he has to trick us. Get real subtle. It's, it's not really pornography. It's just... I just, I, it ain't, it ain't, it's just, and before you know it, your lifestyle is the enemy of the cross, before you know it, and then you justify it, and you save, and people look at you, oh, thank you so much, you are so awesome, thank you, and you got this private little thing going on, and you haven't brought to the cross because you're just trying to relieve yourself. If you only knew, Pastor, the discouragement and the depression and how hurt I am and how unnoticed I am and how left out I am and how much I've given my life and how much I've done, you'd understand why I'm engaged in this. And Paul said, I don't see that in the text. I don't see that in the text. So to the new Christian, here's my, 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 my main thing for the new Christian in the room. And I said it once, I'm going to say it again. In the kingdom we follow faithful examples. There's all kinds of faithful examples in the room. They're older than us. And, and those of you who are older, stop acting like that's a curse. That's a glory. We need you. We need your wisdom. All kinds of, all kinds of people in the room. I won't point you out because somebody will get offended by that, calling me old. You know, I'm like, all the old people here, Pat Shields, wave at them. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Come on, wave, Pat. Don't be calling me old. You know, Margaret Bordeaux said, I'm old. <laughs> Glory to God. We have, and she's a wonderful, faithful example. I had a bunch of names now, but I'm scared to call them out because I'm either going to leave somebody out or I'm going to call somebody old who don't want to be called old. So I'm not going to call any names. I'm trying to grow up in the Lord, too. <laughs> I don't want to fight. Get the message. Let's not fight. Aren't y'all tired of fighting? I'm like, yeah, this is what y'all want to do? Y'all want to wake up and fight over stuff that ain't going to matter when Jesus comes back? Huh? And all that's going on in the world and setting up in these last days, we're going to fight over some chairs. All we see what's going on in Israel and Syria and all the world events setting up for the last days. I just said last days. All the world events setting up, and you, want, you have an earthly perspective. You're, you're too much looking down here. Jesus is coming back soon. All right, so, 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 so we got to follow these faithful, there's faithful examples in the room of people who just live. All you got to do, and, and, and listen, I'm going to speak on behalf of us who have issues. Say amen, Pastor. When we come to you, we're not asking you to solve all of our problems. We're looking for somebody just to listen. Say amen. I'm speaking on behalf of you that kind of, you know, one day you up, next day you down. And then you go, so just go to lunch with me. Just go to lunch with me. Just go to lunch with me. I, I, I told y'all this. I had a small group, and they had a baby in the small group, and the baby was crying, 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 crying. And I said, well, how old is the baby? And they said, it's 34 months. And so I'm up here going to carry the tube. 
plus five, eight, 30. For, tell me how old the kid is. Got me counting. <laughs> He's 34 months. Tell me how old the baby is. <laughs> I'm over here trying to count. I said, well, that baby's almost three years old and still carrying a bottle. I said, when are y'all going to give the baby some real food? You think so? I said, he got more teeth than any monster I've ever seen before. <laughs> but we should give him some food. They fed that baby some food. Do you know that kid slept for like three days? You know what the revelation I got from that conversation? I'm giving out the kid advice. We in trouble, church. If I'm the one giving the advice, we are in trouble. These mamas need some help around here. If I'm the one giving babies, I'm like, well, I'm just looking at him. He got all these teeth in his mouth. Y'all might give that kid a piece of corn and call it, get that kid a corn on the cob. <laughs> so he'll go to bed. Lord, no wonder got that kid drinking milk. We need some faithful examples, and us younger people need to get around some of these people. Say amen. I'm just talking about lunch, dinner, one evening. Y'all don't have, some of y'all think that when I get into your life, and I'm talking about anybody, not just me, that means you're supposed to text me about your whole day, every day, all day. It don't mean that. All you do is run everybody off that can help you. When you start, well, I stubbed my toe. I don't even know why the Lord gave us feet. Well, hold on now. Keep that to yourself. <laughs> Keep that to yourself. Don't chase off your faithful examples. And Paul said, we got all these kingdom citizens. He says, I want you to imitate you. When I got out of juvenile detention, I moved in with my dad. He said something that was powerful because I wasn't a believer. I was an atheist. I was racist. I was, I, and then if I was going to be something, I was going to be Muslim, I told him. I was trying to make him mad. I think I'm going to be Muslim anyway. I'm going to be in the nation of Islam. I was telling him everything. And every time he say something, I'd quote something from the Quran. And my dad said, I don't care what you do. I want you just to watch me. Watch me. And I watched that man. And that's where the change was for me. And what we're saying, when you start, you know when you know you're growing as a kingdom citizen? When you can faithfully say, watch me. Watch how I handle adversity. Watch how I deal with difficult things. Watch how I handle my stuff. Don't, list, don't just take my... See, some people think that when you reach a point, you just get to give out advice and everybody has to take it. No. Eat what you, We want to know what you're really eating. And let us watch you eat it and let's see if you get through it. And then I'll go, you know what? I'm going to eat the same thing they was eating. Hopefully. Here's a quote that I have on your note sheet. But first, look at that. Brothers and sisters, imitate me. We already read that. But here's the quote. We need concrete examples while it's wrong to put our trust in any man, it is hypocritical for any Christian to say, do as I say, not as I do. So we're not saying people need to be put on a pedestal. You put me up on a pedestal, I'm going to fall, break my leg and my back, okay? I'm human too. Nobody here is perfect. But we need people out in front of us who are living godly and getting through difficulty. So all I'm saying is every once in a while, find somebody out ahead of you, go to lunch with them, talk to them a little bit. Talk to him a little bit, all right? Where's, where's, come here, Blake. Come here, Blake. Come here, get on. You act like you're 47. Come on, brother. You're supposed to have some pepper. All right, so you, so he, hook on here. Grab a hold of my, no, don't hug me. Lord. <laughs> hook, grab on right here, all right? So, so, so you know a train, a train is the front, front cart. That's the train. It has the engine, right? And these are carts. Hook on to Blake. Look on the blade. Grab his waist. We'll, we'll, we'll pray for you at the service. All right? Now, these are carts. Come here, Dalton. Come here, wrestler, Dalton. Now, put your hand on her shoulders because the Me Too movement. We don't want no issues up in here. Put her hand on her shoulders. All right? So, now, now this, so we hook up to the cart. And so wherever I go, look. You see what I'm saying? This is what we're supposed to. Is this a good visual for you? Does this make sense? And uh, uh, it's a train. So we need some people to be trains in here and allow people to hook up to them and go where they go. Good job, kids. Look at that. Good job. All right? We need some people to hook up to. And there are people in this room, if you're going to hook up to somebody, you got to make room for that. Well, I just couldn't get out of bed. Oh, I just couldn't do Oh, you know, my back leg is acting funny. you got to make a priority out of this thing. It's got to become a priority. You don't want to live as the enemy of the cross. So if Paul said, follow me as I follow Jesus. Does that make sense? So there's three lifestyles that I'm going to ask you to stop or to pray about or to quit doing. Three how not to do's. How about that? Let's roll so I don't take too much more of your time. The first one is stop letting my desires be my God. That's the first one. Stop letting my desires be my God. Just because you feel it don't mean you should do it. Amen. Amen. 
Just because you feel, F-E-E-L, your feelings aren't always telling you the truth. Your feelings are not always telling you the truth. You should cuss them out. No, you shouldn't. You need this job. Glory to God. You need this job. Your feelings. Your feelings have to stop being your God. Paul said, in the end, they'll be destroyed. Their emotions are their God. Why is he saying that? He's saying, whatever you feel, your behavior follows behind how you feel. If your behavior is what follows behind how you feel, then your, your, your feelings are really your God. So even if I don't feel like loving my neighbor, even if I don't feel like blessing my enemies, I do it anyway because God is God, not my feelings. Does that make sense? And that's a struggle for me because I thought I was faking it. Faking is presenting something that's saying, I'm this way, but you're really not. You're being deceptive. You're trying to gain and leverage something to make yourself appear a certain way. When you say, okay, I'm going to bless this person even though I don't feel it, that means you're trusting in the word of God. And anytime you trust in the word of God, that's the realest thing you can do. So when God tells you what to do about someone, something, you do it irregardless of how it makes you feel. And sometimes doing a godly thing just does not feel good. Amen. Sometimes you do it from a sense of duty. The only reason why I'm doing it, Lord, is because you told me to. And I'm glad God is not like our parents. You know, you had to smile when you mowed the line in my mama's house, you know. You better smile, boy. I'm like, for what? I don't want to do this. You know, God goes, okay, go ahead and frown your face, but you're still mowing this line. Okay? And that's your challenge. And then we're hoping that eventually the doing and the trust in God transforms your emotions. If you're waiting for your emotions to transform before you do it, you're going to be here for a minute. They don't just transform. They are not to be, we're not to be led. God didn't give us emotions to be led by them. Some people think they should deny their emotions. I don't think that's healthy either. Just act like you ain't got no emotions. Man, that's not it. It's not letting your emotions be your compass. Your emotions, sometimes it's just a check engine light. You need some sleep. Why are you mad? You're like, I don't even know. I'm going to go take a nap. Y'all should let him take a nap. You should go, go ahead, honey. Go lay down because we don't like this version of you right now. <laughs> sometimes it just means you need a nap. Sometimes it means you need to eat, you know, bless God. And sometimes it just means you're mean. And you need to bring that to the cross and ask the Lord to transform your meanness. Say amen. amen. Some of y'all are just mean and angry and you've gotten away with it and just mad at everything. Well, that first song Matt sang show was fast. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Stop being, this ain't worth it. Overly consumed with why? Well, Brett's over there. He ain't saying amen. What's he thinking? People do this stuff. They miss the whole point of the service. Because their feelings are really they God. And they come to church hoping their feelings get ministered to. I hope they say something make my feelings feel good. That's not what we're here for necessarily. All right? Look what Romans says about it. People who are ruled by their desires think only of who? <laughs> so leaders, all my leaders, just look at me for a second. If you're a leader, if you're, if you're a boss, if you're a boss or you own property, or uh, it's hard sometimes for people because you're thinking about everybody, not just the person you're talking to. It's like that with your kids too. You're thinking about there's five other kids in this family, not just you. But they can't, immature people can't discern that. All they can think about is themselves. So you just got to remember when you're talking to immature people, they don't understand that when you respond to them, you're thinking about the whole family. You're thinking about the whole group. But you got to understand, they they are ruled by their desires. You don't have no control over that, boo-boo. You don't have control over that. So you got to stick with the whole family. You got to stick with the whole group. You can't, for one person, let them, that's where we get, that's where we get sibling rivalry. That's where we start having issues on the job. You start making special decisions for a person that's in front of you because they're overly mad about your response because you were thinking about the whole group. But you got to remember, they're ruled by themselves. They're ruled by, they only think about themselves. And they'll even tell you, well, I thought about this for the whole group, but I still want my way. Okay, well, <laughs> you didn't think about it really good then, did you? All right. Now, if you're ruled by the Spirit, 
You think about spiritual things. You think about spiritual stuff, right? You're, you're on a higher plane. You're not just locked in immediate gratification in yourself and what's in it for me. You're thinking about the whole body. What's good for the whole body? What's good for the whole group? There's another trend. The NIV says like this, those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according with the Spirit have their mind set what is on the Spirit. So in other words, Jesus in John chapter 3 says, you are born of the Spirit. By the power of the Spirit, a person is born. And if you're born of the Spirit, therefore you must live by that same Spirit from which you were born from. And this is how we have to live. This is the Spirit that glorifies Christ with everything we say and do. And now the Spirit is my compass. So Romans 8 goes on to say, For the children of God are led by my Spirit. The Spirit is the train. You are hooked up to it. All right? Now we're talking about abiding in Him. Look at the second thing, taking pride in shame. Stop taking pride in shameful things. This was the place where I landed myself, where I got convicted. Uh, For me, it's like, yo, there are some shameful things that we should not be celebrating, that we should not be glorying in. We should not smile about. We should not think it's funny. And I said, okay, Lord, you got to give me a conviction for this. You know, it's just some things we should not. He said their pride is what they should. He said, you should be ashamed of this. You should be ashamed of how you judge people. We should be ashamed of how we judge other people and overly worry about what other people are doing in their business. We should be ashamed of that. Not bragging, "Uh uh-huh, girl, and I checked in on it, and I did a research, and I found out. They ain't living right. That ain't your business necessarily unless you're discipling them. It's not your business unless you're an elder or something. What you worrying about that for? And you're bragging on something you should be shamed about. You glory in it. And in a small town, it's easy to glory in gossip because it's a small town. And I I was talking to somebody, I said, man, we show enough gossip. And somebody said to me, well, you know it's a small town. I said, well, then don't bring up Chicago to me no more then. Because every time y'all talk about shooting up Chicago, I can say, well, you know, it's just Chicago. So you can justify sin and just make it, well, you know, this is what we do here in Chanute. Not us. Not us Chanuteans. See, that's shameful behavior. And we can just go on and on. I have a whole list here, but it's in Scripture. <laughs> I said, Lord, do I put it on the note sheet or not? Because I <laughs> the Chiefs are playing later on. Lord, we don't need to be fighting for the Chiefs play. This is how me and the Lord talk. You know, Lord, the Chiefs, Patrick Mahomes, you know, you made them. You know who he is. <laughs> Lord. <laughs> it's like, Lord, we trying to watch some football later on. Look at this. People's desires make them give in in more way. Filthy thoughts, shameful deeds. They worship idols practice witchcraft, hate others, hard to get along with. Boy, you can be saved for 47 years and be hard to get along with and won't nobody say nothing. All the saved people are afraid to address the hard to get along with person. They can just get away with it. And they'll talk about homosexuals and they'll talk about drunkards and they'll talk about everybody else's sin. And they, they ain't got but four friends and behind them is a train wreck of relationships. And can't nobody say nothing to them. I'm so glad I said, Paul, God bless you, Holy Spirit hard to get along with. People become jealous, angry, and selfish. They not only argue and cause trouble, they are envious. They get drunk, carry on a wild parties, do other evil things as well. I told you before, and I'm telling you again, no one who does these things <laughs> sharing the blessings of God's kingdom. Phil, are you with me? You, we're going to have four people at church. Y'all got to come back next week to encourage the pastor. <laughs> I said, Holy Ghost. I mean, you look at that list, man. Jealous, angry, selfish, hate others, worship idols. This is rough. Filthy thoughts. Filthy thoughts. That's Holy Bible. Now, don't kill the messenger. Do not be controlled by your body. Kill every desire for the wrong kind of sex. Don't be immoral or indecent or have evil thoughts. Don't be greedy. Oh, here they go, talking about Mexico again. You just be quiet with your greedy self. Yeah, just be quiet with your greedy self. Just hold on to your little 15 cents. See, it's the same as worshiping idols. Look, God is angry. <laughs> 
Yeah, what version of God y'all got? We're going to read the whole Bible at this church. We're reading the whole Bible at this church. God is angry with people who disobey him by doing these things. I know our Facebook Live is empty. It's all good. We'll see y'all next week. I was so convicted on this, man. I said, man, I got to, Lord, you got to help me. That word, You see, all of them, all, I found almost 15 scriptures in these lists. Anger was in all of them. Some of y'all walk around here anger and think you're still living out your life in the, in the fullness of the kingdom of God. And what, whew, Anger was on all of them. Every time the Bible mentions Cain after his deal, it's, it's, it's not good, y'all. Anger is rooted in Cain. Anger is rooted in Cain. And, by, and you know what the God told anger about his, well, you know what God told Cain about his anger? He said, if you do the right thing, if you would just make the right decision, wouldn't you feel differently? So you mad at everybody else, and God's going to look at you and go, it's really you. Because if you were so holy, you would find yourself, the only person who really can be angry is God. I mean, at the end of the day, there's some, there, you know, you run my kids over, you hit my kid and keep your car rolling, you know, I'm be angry. <laughs> I'm be angry. I'm not even going to the list of things I might do. There's some things that we can really have some justified anger, but it's, it's a small list. God has angry people who disobey him by doing these things. Let's, let's move on because even I'm discouraged. Setting your mind on earthly things was the third thing we could stop doing. This is the overly consumption with the things that's going on this planet. This overconsumption. Thinking about only about this. You, every problem should be looked in the light of eternity, not in the light of this planet. That's the whole point of Ecclesiastics. If all you're going to do is look at it underneath the sun, it's a waste of time. If all you do is go, I'm going to be wise, I'm wise, but are you saved? Wise people are going to split hell open. Just like the fool. So wisdom is only good as long as we're looking at it towards the cross. All right, very good. We're on the same page. All right. Wise or foolish, we all die and are soon forgotten. See there? So if you're, if you're just living for this planet... Soon forgotten. That's very existential there for us. There, That's very depressing. All right? Three things to consider. Let's roll through it real quick. Our home is heaven. That's the first thing I want you to consider this morning. Aren't you glad? No annoying people up in heaven, guys. Woo! Yes. Come on now. You know how people just annoy you. Come on, y'all. I know I'm not the only one. Jesus go, man. And you know what? They don't miss. They, they're, there. they're here every Sunday. <laughs> they don't miss. Annoying people do not miss. <laughs> they don't miss a Sunday. You're like, oh, but there they are. Sure enough. All right. But your home is in heaven. Annoying people won't be there in heaven. You are sitting in heaven. I come to encourage you. That annoying person that's across the room, you know, y'all, I love it how y'all have to sit across from each other. Like, where are they sitting at? Okay, let's go over here. Let's get them over here. Hey, that's healthy. That's healthy. Came to church. It's hard doing church in a small town. We know too much about each other. I just know too much about you. It's hard doing church in a small town. Say Amen. Small town church. For us to have a church this large in a small town, that's a miracle. Because we know, everybody know everybody's business. I can just throw out a name. Y'all go, yeah, I, I got something on them. I got something on them. <laughs> I got something on them. <laughs> right? But we're citizens of heaven. That's going to be gone in heaven. All right? We're not going to be doing that in heaven. All right? So consider that this morning. Whatever you're dealing with, consider that. So what's your point, Pastor? What's your point with our home is heaven? This is my point. If, if your home is heaven, then do what they do there in the here and now. So we, we, we give justice and we give mercy at the same time. We, we do acts of mercy. We forgive. That's what they're doing in heaven, right? We practice heaven culture down here on this planet. Compassion. Come on, somebody. Long-suffering. If you would just know that the person who's the wicked sinner in this room, they're not going to always be that way if the Holy Spirit touched their life. Why are you stuck here in the immediate here and now? The same God that rescued you will rescue them and change their life too. Come on, somebody. You got to be long-suffering with people. You got to hang in there with them. You got to hang in there with them. I know they ain't supposed to be doing it. I know. We got people in here doing stuff they ain't supposed to be doing. Let me hide behind you while I say that because I know how y'all are when I start doing it. They ain't supposed to be doing it, and we ain't celebrating it. But I can guarantee there ain't a person in this room who hasn't lived that way. Not a one of you. And you can be saved and totally forget that. 
Yeah, we know what you was doing last summer. Well, I'm a grandpa now. Yeah, but we still be watching you too. In the nursing home, I'll be watching. They be goosing nurses in the nursing home. We watching them. Come on now, somebody. Just because you 74 don't mean you ain't got some work to do in here. And I love it when Mr. Winans said amen. Where's Mr. Winans at? I can hear his voice. Saying, God bless you, Mr. Wine. He's an older gentleman. He could be offended. Here he go talking to the old people. He said, no, amen. God's still working on me, pastor. That's the type of example I'm talking about. Now, here he go talking about the old. Let him bring up black woman. Let him say black one more time. <laughs> Fired up, man. God bless your heart. Above all, this is what Philippians 1. Live as citizens of heaven. Our goal is to live as right now. You live as right now. We're not waiting. On, we're bringing heaven now. Bring heaven with you tomorrow at work. It ain't Manic Monday for you. Bring heaven. Manic Monday is the world. Oh, it's Monday. You ain't got to do that. Bring heaven with you. That don't mean anything goes. That don't mean you don't set boundaries. Just bring heaven with you when you're setting your boundaries. Bring heaven with you when you come to church and that annoying person's across the room. Some of y'all, look, Murray back there yelling, I can't stand you, Murray. He annoys me too sometimes, but I still love him. <laughs> I still got I still got love the man. I'm about to throw my boot at him right now, but I gotta love him. <laughs> I gotta love him. We gotta get through this together. How are we gonna do it without each other? Just when you think you're done, you're gonna be straight on the side of the road. And guess who's gonna pull up? Murray. You need some help? <laughs> oh, yeah. I got an amen for you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, all right. You, you, listen, they, uh, one, I heard the story about Ronald Reagan when he got shot, and the EMTs came down and asked him, you know, we're going to help you out, President, and all this. He said, are you, are you, are you Republican? And he was just joking, because when you get shot, you don't be caring. Wait a minute. What do you believe? Do, are you Armenian or are you Reformed? Are you, you don't ask, do you believe in speaking in tongues? No, just get me to the hospital, dog, right? You don't know. The person that you, you hating on right now may be the person that rescue you out of a situation. The tables can turn quick up in here. All right now, okay. I'll preach your funeral. I sure will. <laughs> we confidently expect Christ to come. This is an expectation. Confidently. Guys, he's coming back. He's coming back. Hang in there. Those of you who are weary, you're tired, you're beat up by what you see going on this planet. I mean, do all the kids have to be disrespectful? You know, you just look at this planet right now. You're like, do all of them? Can I get one kid that can just say, yes, ma'am, no, sir, just one? Some days is gone. I just want one. I mean, I was like, man, you had pizza. Hey, kids, what you looking at? Dang, this is Chanute. They gang banging this Chanute now? My goodness. Like, yeah, you got to start just confidently expecting Christ is coming back. We got to just hang our hats on that. Christ is coming. Our outlet goes beyond this world. This is J.B. Phillips' translation. To the hopeful expectation. He's coming back. Woo. Thank you, Lord. Lastly, I'm almost there. We're almost there. True, trans true transformation is coming. Man, these glorious bodies, man, listen, y'all. Yes. Tom Brady ain't got nothing on this. This glorious body that's coming, man, y'all, I can't wait. Y'all think I'm crazy right now? I get my glorious body, I'm going to be gone just running. Did you think you're done running? I can't. I don't have to stop. <laughs> I can just run. The only reason why I stop now is I get tired. <laughs> I got the energy. The body's like, no, sit down. <laughs> True transformation is coming in the presence, the holy of holies with Jesus. No more anxiety, depression, discouragement. No more suicidal thoughts. No more insecurities, defeatism. No more. No more being little, being small. No more being neglected, overlooked, misunderstood. No more cultural difference in fights. No more slavery, rape, cancer. No more true transformation, evil abolished. When we all get to heaven, man, shoot. That's glorious. That's glorious. So what we're going to do. That's like 40-minute sermon right there. I just gave you everything I had. What we're going to do is we're going to pray. This is a chance. So I don't do altar calls all the time because I, can, I, I know we got a lot of old school people in here. And it makes you feel good when people come to the altar. That makes you all feel good. Not, not me. <laughs> but I, I, I am going to do one this morning. Altar calls are symbolic 
of an inward decision. You can come forward, but if you don't come forward in your heart, it does not matter. So coming forward is a symbolic thing. It's an outward decision provoked by an inward change that's going on in your heart. And before we take communion this morning, I want to open up the floor to allow us the opportunity to repent. And I'm going to be the first repenter in this room. So I'm going forward too. So you can repent with the pastor. So nobody should feel insecure about having to repent this morning because pastor's going to repent too. Our challenge this morning is to get into the way of holiness. Well, I want to grow up. I want to love people like Jesus loves people. I want to accept people like Jesus wants to accept people. And I want to be able to tell people the truth like Jesus tells people the truth. Come on, somebody. Sometimes you just got to tell them the truth. That ain't good. <laughs> Stop that, all right? And so, I, and so the challenge for us is to become like Christ. And your marriage ain't where it's supposed to be. Your kids ain't where it's supposed to be. Your money ain't where it's supposed to be. But the, still the challenge is the same. Become like Christ. So I got just one question. If there's anybody who wants to repent with me this morning, just come on up. And we're going to repent together. If anybody who wants to repent with me this morning before we take communion, you can just come on up. We're just going to repent together. You ain't got to worry about nothing. Pastor's repenting too. So we're doing this together. You know, you're harboring ill feelings. Harboring ill feelings, angry. Some of y'all just came out the club. Just repent. Just repent. Let's, we're going to just give it to Jesus. We're just going to give it to Jesus this morning. I'm, I'm with you this morning. You're not by yourself. I'm repenting too. Mm-hmm. 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 See, the enemy would love to keep you in the past. He would love to bring your sins up and keep you there. He wants to make you think you can't change. You're no good. God can't use you. God don't forgive you. I'm so glad Jesus Christ died and raised again so that we could be forgiven. Amen. All right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing that everybody does admit in the church is that we're supposed to live a lifetime, lifestyle repentance. So we're repenting every day. But there are some moments in time, like right now, even for myself, where you're like, you know what, Lord, I've let some things pile up. I've let some dispositions pile up. I've let some behaviors and attitudes pile up. And I'm tired, Lord, and I've done some things in my tiredness, and I've said some things in my tiredness that ain't of you, and I'm just giving that to you. And let me tell you something. When you leave this altar, washed away. As far as, as, far as the east is to the west, on the ocean floor. And listen, now, now, your haters don't like to hear that. Now, you're going to have some haters. They don't want you to live in this victory. You're going to have some people that may, some of you know what I'm talking about. Some people do not want to see you living victorious. They do not want to see you living as a new creature. They want to keep you down as the stepchild. Keep you down, all right? You can't worry about that. You walk out your new life in Jesus Christ and let God deal with your enemies and your haters, all right? Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, right now, each person that's up here, including myself, Lord, are repenting. Any disposition, any thought, any type of behavior, any, any type of neglect in obeying you and following you and acting like you, Lord, we give that to you this morning. Lord, we are so grateful that you are holy, that you are forgiving, that you are compassionate, and you love for your children to bring their stuff to you. So we bring it to you, Lord. I pray that we'll have a sense of new life beginning now. Not immediate gratification, but new life. Lord, help us to begin to walk out in new steps and new ways, trusting in you. Lord, I pray that as you start fitting our life in the way that you want it to be, you'd give us the endurance, the integrity, and the wisdom to obey you, to follow you, and to stay focused on you. Help us to confidently wait for the day that your son comes and sets everything right once and for all. We love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Come on, let's give God some praise. Amen. Amen. All right, fist bump somebody and tell them, I'm glad for you. I'm glad for you. I'm glad for you. I'm glad for you. You can go back to your seat. I'm glad for you. I'm glad for you. I'm glad for you. Come on, give God a round of applause one more time, church. Amen. 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 I'm going to call Pastor Rick and tell me the Southern Baptist Church did good this morning. I'm going to ask the deacons to come as we get ready for communion. Um, just this last uh, Tuesday, um, do I have any deacons that can help me with communion this morning? Any deacons in the house? Who set the communion up? Oh, there you are. All right. God bless you. 
<laughs> I was getting nervous, like, well, hey, Brad, will you come over? <laughs> uh, you know, on Tuesday morning, we were getting ready, um, um, and we were talking about the Passover, and we were looking at the Passover meal on Tuesday morning, my 6.30 in the morning Bible study, and we're looking at that Last Supper and all the different images and how Jesus is basically reinterpreting what this meal really means to these guys who grew up celebrating this event every year, they thought they knew what the Seder meal meant. They thought they knew what the Passover meal meant. And Jesus is sitting there, and, he, and they're getting things ready, and they're about to eat, and Jesus is like, this is all about me. And when he said, do this in remembrance of me, he's saying, this is all about me. And that, if you want to know where I'm really trying to head, baby steps, it's like, I want a life that reflects it's all about Jesus. Even when I'm resting, it's about Jesus. Even when I'm taking a break, it's about Jesus. Even when I'm taking a stand, it's about Jesus. When I'm being compassionate, it's about Jesus. And this, this meal here, where he breaks that bread and he says, this is my body. This imagery is so powerful that he broke his body for us. So that any, even when it comes to healing, it's available to you. When it comes to any manner that's in your life that's not of God, he's saying, this is available to you. And then he poured that wine, signifying his blood, letting us know there's a new covenant on the scene now. The old has passed away and new has come because of the shedding of his blood. And it's a precious thing. There's only one Jesus. He's one of a kind. That's what makes his blood so precious. And it covers all of our sins. And I don't care. Now, the enemy's job is to bring them up. And your job is to preach the blood. That's what my grandma used to say. The enemy's job is to bring it up. Your job is to preach the blood. Sometimes I told, I'm trying to teach Jada this. You pray for her. She's sick, so she couldn't come this morning. But I'm trying to teach Jada, stop listening to yourself and preach to yourself. Sometimes the, you got to have a Billy Graham on the inside of you. You know what I'm saying? Go, no, devil, that's not right. And you got to go, I'm covered by the blood. His blood paid the price. If you don't know what that means, you should probably come to my Tuesday morning Bible study. You should probably come at 6.30 in the morning, Tuesday morning. 6.30, when? In the morning. Bible study, yes. His blood paid the price so that you can take of this cup and this bread. All right? You can remember him, and you can take steps into your new life, and you can know him more and more every day. We're going to overcome this enemy. Guys, you're looking at a hope-filled pastor. I believe great things are in store for us. Y'all can be beat up. I'm not going to judge you, but I can't do it with you. I'm coming from victory. I'm made up in my mind. I got, a, I got the Holy Ghost in me. I got to enter. My Holy Ghost is like Patrick Mahomes, too. He be throwing passes, amazing passes, no look passes, making a way out of no way. Just when we're in the pocket and we think we're about to be sacked, the Holy Ghost somehow comes through. And could you imagine being the player that gave up on the play because you didn't believe? You give up on the play. Some of y'all just give up on the play and then try to act like he was there. And then we score a touchdown. Y'all over there, yeah, trying to get on a celebration. Now, we can watch the film. You gave up on the play. Some of y'all have given up on people on the other side of the room already. God's working their situation out. You don't even know it. And you got to take communion. And God's work. Lay that at the cross. God's worked that person in the room that you don't like. He's already worked it out. Say amen. amen. He's a victorious reigning God. He's already worked it out. So you can take communion hope-filled. Marriage on the rocks, take communion with hope in your mind. Money is funny. Take communion with hope. It's all about Jesus. We're going to pray, and then at, at this church, we serve an open table. If you confess Christ as your Savior, he's the Lord of your life, and your aim is to please him, all right, you can take communion this morning, all right? Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, before we take up these elements, let Jesus reign. Help us to pursue you. Help us to forgive one another. Help us to lay down all of our hurts and oughts and stuff that keeps us from behaving like you. Help us to make our one aim to please you with our life. We love you so much, Jesus. We lift up one more time to you, the Andrus family and Precious Harper. We thank you for their commitment to you and your kingdom. We know the enemy has tricks and schemes down the road. Help us to be alongside with them. Lord, we lift up those who couldn't come this morning, all of our sick and shut-ins. We pray for them right now. We pray for the Collins family. 
right now in the name of Jesus. We pray for the castings right now, or that you'd be with them and all the other shut-ins who are unable to make it today or that have emergencies going on. We ask that your spirit would be with them. We love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I have one little housekeeping note. Um, this takes a little while.